All right, episode 589 of Let There Be Talk. It is May 3rd, a Monday. Welcome aboard, Pirates. Welcome aboard, Dell Razors and Lunatics. Great guest today. Holy smokes. You like a little guitar? You like, you like punk rock? You like to go crazy? <laughs> Paul Leary is here from the Butthole Surfers and many other incredible projects that he has worked on in his lifetime, 63 years old and a legend in my eyes. Holy smokes. He's got a brand new solo record out, first one in 30 years, came out February 12th during the COVID, so it needs extra shout outs. Tell all your friends and Tweet about it, Facebook, and Instagram about it. We need to go grassroots on all these great releases that have happened during the 19. Born Stupid, Paul Leary's brand new solo record. Very, very kick-ass. I'll tell you, man, uh, Butthole Surfers, you want to talk about an original band and also a group of humans that you want to get some work ethic from. These fuckers grew up in the van. These guys did it old school, getting banned houses, bouncing around from state to state, wherever it was cheap to live and just touring their asses off. Butthole surfers. Remember the song Pepper? Just screaming all over your radio. One of the most... Outside the box hits ever to happen. Lollapalooza, season one. That's what I call Lollapalooza now. Season one. Remember that? The original. Man, these guys kick ass. And Paul was a great, great guest, man. The guy had me cracking up all the way through. I loved it. Towards the end, we show each other. Uh, he shows me his cat. We were doing this on Zoom. His cat looked like Ace Freely. Uh, I said Paul Stanley, but I, I was just I messed up because or Gene Simmons, either one. And then I showed him a little Gertie, my my dog, and uh, we had a little love fest there. Anyway, Paul Leary is here today. I want to thank everybody for the kind words on my brand new podcast network that I'm launching, CactusRadioNetwork.com. And uh, I announced the couple new shows on it. One is At Home with Byron Katie. And the other one is Dark Fonzie with Mark Marin and Dean Delray. And we're just waiting for iTunes. I am just going crazy. I've been pulling my hair out for a week because I posted all the stuff up. And then iTunes was like, these shows require artwork. And the fucking artwork is there. Everything they need is there. It's the perfect size they ask for. It's the perfect, uh, you know, so, uh, the dimensions. Nothing under uh, 1,400 by 1,400. Nothing over 3,000 by 3,000. All that computer jargon. Everything's perfect. And it's just in this fucking limbo land and it has stressed me out so much over the last week i've just been oh man laying in bed just furious i want these shows to come out because they're good i'm pretty damn proud of having a podcast network and i'm yeah i'm a one-man show and you you email apple and it's just insane you know, like, uh, did you uh, try to uh, upload the artwork? Yeah, fuck yeah. I've been only podcasting for 10 years. I know how to fucking do it. And then you wait 24 hours and they come back. Oh, you, you did. You uploaded the artwork. Okay, uh, maybe try to delete it and upload the artwork again. Get the fuck out of here. Just have a phone number. For one second, I can call and go, hey. Here's the deal. Artwork's been up. It's all right. It's something on your end. I know you're restructuring the back end of your entire iTunes platform. So maybe can you look at this for a second and just press some kind of fucking key on your keypad and make it fucking work? 
anyway, it's rare that I get uh, furious, but man, I, and, and look, I love Apple. I'm not one of those people, fuck, fuck Apple, that's what you get, man. Go to, go to Android platform, because that fucking makes sense. No, fuck you. Apple till I die. It's just, I, 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 I'm not one of those guys that fucking shits on stuff that makes my life way easier. Like uh, an iPhone or the Apple platform. Look, they all are demons. The corporations are evil. I get it. I get it. But, you know, we can't just be hippies out in Joshua Tree. You got to fucking earn a living. I wish I could just be out there and disappear. Not worry if the fucking comedy clubs are going to book me or if I'm going to be able to work. I wish I could just be out in the tree on some psychedelics, man, and just fucking fuck the evil empire. But we're alive in 2021, and the corporations fucking guide the ship, man. And I just try to have happiness amongst the evil. That is what I try to do each day when I wake up. There's no reversing it. It's, it, it's, it's the machine. So you just try to grasp a couple minutes of happiness each day, like a kick-ass taco or putting on a fucking smoking record or looking at my dog Gertie as she's happy as hell. Whatever it is, small little nuggets of happiness keep me going. Way better than any fucking pill you're going to take. Oh, okay. That's off my goddamn hairy chest. Yeah, I don't shave my chest because uh, I don't have my shirt off a lot. <laughs> Shout out to one of the greatest uh, silk screening companies I've ever dealt with. It is the greatest. Not one of the greatest. It is the greatest. Silk Shop screen printing and chico they have been printing all my merch and finally i have found somebody that rivals my vision and insanity over silk screening i'm always looking for the perfect t-shirt and man these guys print it and do it right use them up this is not an advertisement i just love these guys' passion silk shop Printing, S I L K S H O P, silkshopprinting.com. They've been doing all that merch. Have you been getting that new Delray stuff like the Perry Shaw shirt? They've been doing that stuff, and uh, we got some new shit coming out. Can't wait. Maybe a dark Funzy shirt. Maybe. And um, shout out to the new Patreoners Hayden Moore, Matt Garville. Andrew, Phil John Jones, Joseph Sheehan, and my man Steve McDonald with a solid donation. Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. 105 bonus episodes. And every week I do a Zoom fest where you can join me live on Zoom and shoot the shit with me and all kinds of other Del Razors. DeanDelRay.com, all tour dates, lots of shows coming. DeanDelRay.com, all tour dates. Please do not email me and say, when are you coming to such and such? It's all on the website. That's why I had my man AJ Simmons build a website so you guys can find it and I can spend time editing the 700 podcasts that I do. Ah! <laughs> okay, let's get into it. Here he is right now, the king of punk rock, Paul Leary. All right, here we are, a new episode of Let There Be Talk. Whoa, we got a legend on today. Introduce yourself, my man. My name is Paul Leary. From the Butthole Surfers and a million other great things. How are you, dude? I can't complain. I'm doing pretty good. What are you, 63 I just saw? I can't believe it. That's great. <laughs> I can't believe it either. I know, right? It's, it's like, shocking to look in the mirror, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> what 
Where are you at? Austin, Texas? Austin, Texas. It's changing out there, huh? Yes, it has. I started coming up here in the 70s. I would skip out of high school to come up here and ski dip at the lake and go to the movies and all kinds of stuff. And it was a fun little hippie town. And now it's a big stinky city. <laughs> well, it's, it's a, a, I love when people are like, yeah, Austin's the new spot. And they just start fleeing there, you know, from like California and New York and mm. stuff. This is going to change our lives, you know? Yeah, well, it, it has. It's raised the property taxes uh, amazingly. Yeah, that's interesting, man. The property tax there. You don't have state tax. Everybody's like, yeah, no state tax, but the property tax is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And the, the drag about it is, is that it doesn't go away when you retire. You know, it, income tax kind of goes away when you retire, but not property tax. Well, you know, it's amazing. Um, I always tell people you can run all you want, but there's going to be something where you go that sucks. You know what I'm saying? So, okay, you got high property tax and crazy humidity out there. So there you go. Let's see if you can, you know, some people are like, well, California is a shithole, libertards and all that. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, man. But uh, everything, every state and city has something. If they didn't, uh, you know, it, it's like there's no secret spot where people are like, this is great. There's no taxes. No one lives around here. No traffic. That doesn't exist. Yeah, I remember one time thinking that place was Athens, Georgia. Then, then I kind of dawned on me that there's no good restaurants in Athens, Georgia. Well, you guys were there for a while. You know, what's funny about the Bed Hall Servers is like you guys have lived all over the place. Yeah, there was a time when we would like uh, be on the road for a couple of years and decide we needed to settle down. So we'd pull out a map and a dart and throw a dart from across the room and just go wherever the dart landed. That's how we ended up in Athens, Georgia. It's so amazing, man. You guys are like San Antonio, L.A. We, Athens, we actually Georgia. couldn't afford Athens, Georgia. We we had to move out to the suburbs of Athens to a place called Winterville. And then our, our van caught on fire. So we were forced to have to you know walk 10 miles into town if we wanted to get something to eat. Our next door neighbor started feeling sorry for us and leaving his you know vegetables on our front porch. He had a garden in the back. And so, you know, he, he got tired of us stealing his eggplants and stuff. So he just started bringing it to us. <laughs> I got to tell you, man. You guys, Butthole Surface, whenever I think of a band, and especially in the last probably 20 years of uh, people's work ethic and everything, when they're like, man, we just ain't getting nothing. And then you guys are the soldiers of punk rock and rock and roll. I mean, the, the shit that you guys did to stay as a band and tour and make records is unreal. So we, we didn't have much choice. We burned all of our bridges early on and, and there was no turning back. So we kind of had to stick around with each other and, and make everything work. You know, for years, uh, I grew up in the Bay Area. I, I swore you guys were a San Francisco band. I just it, it, I mean, you guys have San Francisco that, you know, the Melvins, of course, Dead Kennedys in that history have there. But all of that thing of like Primus and everything that was going on back then. It's so San Francisco, the sound. Well, we, you know, we like San Francisco because there were all the soup kitchens, you know, and we knew where to go to get a free meal six days a week. You know, the seventh day was a little rough, but the, you know, there was the uh, church of John Coltrane soup kitchen and a few others like that, where you'd sit down and somebody dressed up as a tree would bring you lunch. <laughs> we, we got our, we got our uh, first record deal in San Francisco. Uh, we were we were driving to San Francisco from Los Angeles and our van broke down on the Bay Bridge and uh, we thought we were going to die up there. It was rush hour and we didn't think we were going to make it to the top of the bridge and we did. Van died and we coasted off the first exit and came to a stop in front of this place called Tool and Die, uh, which turned out to be uh, an old Tool and Die place turned punk rock dive. And we saw punkers loading their band equipment in there, so we started unloading ours in there too and some woman stopped us and said, who are you? And we were like, we're the butthole server. Well, you can't play here. And, and so we started crying. Oh, we, you know, we, we're broken down and we need this. And so she let us play three songs and, and uh, the Dead Kennedys were there and saw those three songs. And Jello signed us to Alternative Tentacles right there. So, I mean, that is the craziest story. Where were you supposed to play in San Fran? I don't know. <laughs> I love that. you're coming over the bay bridge the van breaks down you coast into a joint and go well let's just try to go in here i mean to even think about the odds of that is insane 
it was pretty weird, you know, and, and the majority of our touring days were done pre cell phone. So, you know, we'd have to pull over and look for a pay phone and try to find out where the hell we were supposed to be. And that was always challenging. But it was those were fun days. Oh, man. I mean, you know, those are the days where you really didn't even think about anything except just playing live. That's all you cared about. And beer and pot and <laughs> and so, you know, so a free burrito or something. You're like, dude, we are making it. Yeah. And then you wake up on, you know, on the floor in some stranger's house next to the cat box every morning. And yeah, <laughs> I think about it now as I'm 55, you're 63. I'm like, no fucking way could I do that now, you know? <laughs> I don't think I could either. You know, I just, if I had it all to do over again, I'm not sure I would. <laughs> well, I, 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 I always say no regrets and I am who I am now because of all that, which I love. Um, but you do get a, the calluses uh, melt off over the years and you're like, yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah. I've, I've gotten, I've gotten very soft. Yeah. We used to, you know, our favorite trick was going to a motel six and, hanging out in the parking lot and wait for some trucker to leave his room. Then we run in there and use his shower before, you know, checkout time. Oh man. The old shower, or the day room, somebody else's though. That's <laughs> somebody <great>. else's. <laughs> Let's get into the early days of your, how does it start for you? Because of course, butthole surfers is way outside the box. Is it like Zappa? Is it Diva? What is it for you early on? Um, you know, back then we started like way early eighties, like 81 and, uh, music, music in 81, it, you know, was kind of shitty except for, for punk rock. And, you know, it, I remember listening to the, the meat puppets one day and they had a song called out in the garden or something ridiculous. And it was just sounded like a train wreck. It was like, Oh my God, we can do that. And so we did do that. First trip to California, we stopped in Phoenix and managed to find where they lived and went and stayed at their house for a few nights <laughs> until they <laughs> kicked us out. But That's so punk rock. Like, hey, man, I, I think the meat puppets are here. Let's find them. You know, <laughs> go to their house. And they were very nice to us, too. But what was it for you as far as like guitar? Because you, you do have this distinct kind of dirty, fuzzy thing and everything. Who was it for you early on b before punk rock? Was it any seventies rock you were listening to or anything? Yeah. You know, in the sixties, I started out with the Beatles and then I kind of moved on to Jethro Tull and Grand Funk Railroad and, and ACDC and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I, I started taking guitar lessons back in 1963. My parents bought me a guitar and I took lessons all through high school and I, I never got good at the guitar. It was really it's just ridiculous. I, I spent a lot of time trying and then eventually I just put the guitar down and said, forget it. And, and then uh, um, I met Gibby Haynes at Trinity University and he, you know, spent six months trying to talk me into joining a, you know, making a rock band with him. And eventually I did and then picked my guitar back up again and just forgot all about how I couldn't play and just played it anyway. And, and there it was. What was your first guitar? Was it a good one? Well, my very first guitar was a, a little toy guitar from Mexico. You know, it's probably a ukulele. I think it had four strings and it cost five dollars. And I, I played that and drove my parents crazy. And and then they bought me some cheap acoustic guitar. And then I saw the, the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. I, I have to have an electric guitar. And my dad bought me a really nice one, like a ninety dollar Kalamazoo baby blue guitar with a Kalamazoo amp that had tremolo. And wow. uh, I, I played in the I played in school bands in elementary school and got to play in front of the whole school a couple of times. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was like my first gig. I remember I was nervous, you know, like, uh, oh. Hey, oh, we're playing lunchtime, one song. And you're just like, <laughs> and I got to I'm the singer with no effects or whatever. You know, I'm not there. I, remember, I think we did Purple Haze. You know, I'm like, Purple Haze, I'll lean my brain. You know, it's just like, <laughs> but, you know that was it. I was, uh, it was in my blood and I was off to the races, you know? I, I think, uh, my first song played in front of the elementary school was a stepping stone. Oh, that's a great an one. Old monkey song. Yeah. That's such a good one. Huh? What a hook on that. It's, it's wild. When, when you and Gibby start, I mean, if you look at the debut record, you know, uh, I mean, this record is so crazy and bizarre. 
How are you even writing the tunes? What was the writing process of early Butthole Service? Because it is wild. Well, we started out with a couple of songs that Gibby did most of the writing on, like The Shaw Sleeps and Lee Harvey's Grave. And uh, then we just started jamming and we didn't know what we were doing. And eventually, you know, we would stumble across something when jamming and then, uh, you know, start blubbering lyrics. And then eventually it would just gel. So it was, it wasn't really a sit down kind of thing and write songs. It was just more or less, we, we got to do something when we play next weekend up at the punk rock club. I, I just remember I, I used to, you know, just roam the hate street bars and clubs and everything and i've said this before and you know it was like melvin's and tool playing and all that in the jukeboxes san fran had really good jukeboxes but that rembrandt pussy horse record came on i remember it was about third three songs in and i was like who the fuck is this like what is this it was just it was it was it tom waits meets like bukowski meets like you know zappa as far as being way out there and i was like this is fucking great and then by the time i finally see you guys i'm like wow i don't even know how to do this i was such a you know classic rock guy but i worship devo and craft work but i i I wouldn't know how to do butthole surfer so i was just like fascinated by it yeah, you know, we never put credits on the records. You know, there was never any information. We just had these ridiculous songs, and and nobody knew what to to make of us. And then we were on the road, and and uh, eventually we we became like the, the top grossing independent act in the nation. You know, which got the attention of major record labels, and that's how we were able to, you know, sign with Capitol Records. And boy, was that a trip! Oh well, that is weird because you're going from alternative tentacles to rough trade to uh you know or touch and go then rough trade and then all of a sudden you're on capital and and back then man that is like in most you know the punk rock world that's a no-no you know oh yeah which just made it you know we couldn't resist doing that (laughs) well that's the most punk rock thing to do i always say it's a go-go you know like oh my god let's grab their money so we can live a little bit and make the same shit we're making it was pretty fun because we signed a capital and the next thing you know, we've got John Paul Jones producing an album for us. And the, let me tell you, that was, that was quite a trip. So I, you know, I love Led Zeppelin. I remember exactly where I was when I first heard a whole lot of love, you know, I was in my bedroom at my parents' house with the headphones on and I heard the whole lot of love and remembered who it was. And then the next morning I skipped school and took a bus to the mall to buy the album. And the album was like $5 and I only had $4. Cause that's how much records cost back then. Right. And I was like, five dollars oh, and i was pissed off and i came back home and i scrounged up another dollar and took the bus back out again and got that album and would open it up look at the gatefold that had the you know the names of the band on there and john paul jones Ooh. yeah yeah how now let me get into this because we're, we're going all over but i love it you know zeppelin is my favorite band of all time you know um I just think it's the most dangerous, the most crazy, the, the, the songwriting, everything about it, the production, the instrumentation, each guy insane. But how the hell does this happen that John Paul Jones produces your record? And like, was it your guys' choice or what, what goes down on that? You know, it, it was a, amazing. You know, we had all the A-list producers, you know, throwing their hat in the ring, wanting to produce our record, which was really flattering. And I, I, I couldn't believe it. And then out of the blue, our A&R rep at Capitol reached out to John Paul Jones to see if he was interested. And he was. And so that was it. Wow. So you, uh, I didn't look where the record was done. I never knew, but what studio did you do? And what was it like when you first go in and meet him? Well, he, he first came to Austin and, and spent a week with us in our practice space. Wow. And that was a trip. Cause you know, the Capitol was treating him real nice. They put him up at the four seasons and, I'd go pick him up every morning and there would be people waiting outside the, the hotel waiting for his autograph and stuff. And then, then we go to our really dingy, awful, smelly practice space. And, you know, every once in a while he would break down and jam with us. And that was just that was a real trip. Whoa. And then then we uh, we recorded the album out in uh, Marin County at a place called The Site. Oh, I love The Site, man. That's uh, Keith Richards. Talk is cheap. That's Pearl Jam versus that place is unreal it's like you're in i've I've been there i spent a couple months there and it's like you're in like the return of the jedi the motorcycle scene the you know the space bikes 
It's like you're out in Star Wars land. It was like summer camp. Everybody had their own little cabin and there was a swimming pool. And, you know, we, we had them bring in a pool table so that we could play pool during the downtime. And uh, they, they asked us what we wanted to drink. And I was back then I was a scotch drinker. And I said, oh, I'd, I'd like a Lagavulin and 16 year old single malt. And uh, they asked John Paul Jones what he wanted. And he said, I, I want a Lagavulin and 16 year old single malt. And so we liked the same Scotch whiskey. They brought us a bottle. And that first night we drank that bottle. And the next night there was two, you know, the next day there was two bottles on the table and we drank those two and they kept doubling the amount of bottles every night until it was just like, Oh my God. John Paul Jones ended up quitting drinking entirely after that. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm good. I, I just drank for 10 years. I'm out. What 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 was it like though? Was he in there? Like I mean, he's a genius, and he is so underrated. And and uh, in Zeppelin, people don't understand. You know, when they went and did Page Plan, I was like, look, I I went, of course, because I never got to see Zeppelin, and I worship those guys. But you're missing the no quarter. You're missing the arrangements and the and the keyboards and and all of that stuff. You know, what was he like? He's, you know, he's an extraordinary bass player, you know, just listening, you know, in the old days, you could barely tell what the bass was doing or coming off those vinyl albums through a crappy record player. But later on, when they started remastering that stuff and stereos got better and man, his, his bass is, is where it's at. He, you know, he was the, he was really underrated in that band and he was, he was a super attentive producer. He was the first producer we ever worked with. And, uh, he was in the control room constantly. He never left the control room. He, he was there for every note that went down. And uh, and he was a lot of fun. He's, he's a real swell guy. I mean, he is in through the outdoor. You know, by then, Jimmy's completely fried on heroin. And uh, and Robert's like out of his mind, you know, like, fuck this band or whatever. And Bonzo and John Paul Jones basically put together that in through the outdoors, which is really interesting, you know, and, and also them crooked vultures and, and all the stuff that he's ever done. You got to play on uh, one of his records. That's pretty dope, right? Yeah. Yeah. He came to uh, Austin. I was in the studio producing some band and there was a, a, you know, amp set up with a mic and everything. And so he just brought in a session and wanted me to play guitar on a song. And he wouldn't even let me hear the song before I recorded it. He let me have one take. <laughs> wow. One take. <laughs> Here Why it am I hearing it for the first time? Wow. It just here it is. Go for it. You know? God, that's so wild. My, my cat's meowing at me. He can be a real butthead. <laughs> I got I got a, a dog right here, and she just loves to snore big time during the podcast. Now, what kind of dog do you have? I got a French bulldog. Uh, adopted <sighs> her during COVID. And, uh, awesome. She saved my life, actually, I think. You know, uh, taught me how to love again. We're <laughs> crazy. You know? Yeah, God bless dogs. I know, right? Gertie's her name. Gertrude. We toured with a with a uh, rescue pit bull for years. We, uh, you know, we named her Mark Farner after Grand Funk Railroad. Oh my God! She yeah. saved my life, you know, literally on the road. And she was the she wouldn't even bark at the mailman. She was the sweetest dog in the world, but she could pick a creep out of a crowd. You know, if somebody was a creep, her hair on the back would stand up, and you'd know. So wow, I love that song, "Jingles of the Dog Collar," man. It's so cool. Like it's so crazy how how different your band has changed over the years. It's it's really wild. Like you could put on a record and you would have no idea that it was the butthole surfers compared to like the early stuff. I, I love that about you guys because you really didn't box yourself in. You were like, let's just try whatever. Yeah, we were all over the map, and it's it's really kind of fun to to be like that. I mean, that makes it interesting for touring. Also, you like you play something from the first couple records, and then you play something from the middle of the career, and it's kind of like, what what's going on here? It's so cool. And maybe that's how we were able to do it for so long. Jeez, very long time. I remember the second time I saw you guys was Berkeley uh, Greek Theater opening for uh, Stone Temple Pilots. All right. Actually, they opened for us. You know, they would play and then half the crowd would leave and then yeah. we'd play. So. God, I, I I remember it was uh, it was rocking, though. It was packed, you know. Yeah, they booked, they booked that tour and then Stone Temple Pilots had that video 
their first video and it blew them up big. And so, you know, they were the stars of the shows. Yeah. Plush. Yeah. You know, I, I often, I always wanted to ask somebody in your band this, and I heard this for years. Was that because this is something that was rolling around, you know, like San Francisco. Was that when Whelan starts to do dope? Because he, I, I did hear this, but I, I heard that he was like, he was getting a lot of uh, like, you know, harsh rash, like thrashing over being kind of Eddie Vedderish and that and stuff. And he was looking for a, st- a little street cred and starts doing dope. Is that true on that? It might be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's weird. How I remember that story, you know? Yeah. The, the first, the first few shows were not smooth. You know, it's like uh, during our set, Gibby would say rude things about stone temple pilots. And there was, there was times when people had to hold Waylon back from coming out on stage to kick his ass. I mean, even, and then they were threatening to leave the show. And, and then next thing you know, Gibby's riding on their bus. We don't see him any, anymore until the end of the tour. <laughs> Wow. Wow. It, it is wild to think about that bill it, in my mind. It's so long ago. I thought they were the headliners, you know, but wild that uh, they should have been. Yeah. But how was that package put together? Did like, did you guys think it was a good idea on paper or did you not who the, know who they were? Our, our manager talked us into that one. Yeah. And later you ended up playing on uh, one of their songs. Yeah. That was at uh, Prince's studio Paisley. Whoa. And I even, I even saw him in the hallway, you know, that was like, that was pretty wild. Whoa. No joke. Huh? You got what they recorded a record there or was just a song. I don't, I don't, I don't know how much they recorded there. Cause we were, we were touring and uh, they were kind of like Led Zeppelin. They would record wherever they had a day off. And, and that turned out to be one of the days off. Wow. And uh, I, I guess that that producer was uh, Brendan O'Brien. Oh, he's a genius. Oh okay. Yeah. And uh, that was pretty cool. And it let me play on a song. I, what I did was really awful. I'm embarrassed. I wish I could do it over again. Now, you were in a Paisley Park. Now, I've been to Paisley Park. First of all, it's so weird because you get there and you're like, wait, it's just in some kind of, uh, you know, warehouse history. <laughs> like, it's just off the freeway. You're thinking it's going to be something crazy. And it's just basically a big old warehouse sectioned off into uh, studios. But that studio that they did Purple Rain in and, and all that stuff is just unreal, right? Were you in that one? I don't know. The one, the studio, the control room we were in had a, an API console, and I don't know, you know, if that was their main room or not. It was, it was pretty nice studio. It was probably the nicest studio I'd been in at, at that point. Oh my god! And then you just what come out to take a piss or something? You see Prince? Yeah, yeah. And everybody was saying, "Don't look him in the eye. Don't look him in the eye." And of course, I looked him right in the eye. <laughs> I'm, I'm still alive to tell the story. <laughs> I love that one, man. I've been around some big stars and they're like, the band's going to come down the hall. Just don't look at him. You're like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> like, oh yeah. <laughs> Let me just turn and look at the wall. Can you imagine a band's walking by and they go, get rid of that guy. He looked at me. Oh my God. <laughs> there is some absurdity of uh, big rock big, for sure. It's hilarious. Now, you, uh, of course, have uh, had a great, great run of producing records also, which is very cool. Now, how did you start getting into producing? I know that you once by the time you guys get to the hit Pepper, the big hit, uh, you were producing by then, right? Yeah, I mean, I, pro- I was basically producing the early Butthole Surfers albums and then uh, I didn't even know what a producer was. I just know that we needed to make a record and, you know, how do we do it? Uh, Let's go buy a tape machine or, you know, a microphone and, you know, do what we have to do. And then uh, we're living in Austin and there's this bluegrass band called Bad Livers. And boy, I love that band. And they they were a lot of fun to see. And one time I told them, you know, if you let me produce a record, I'll pay for the studio time. And uh, they agreed to that. And I paid for the studio time and, and produced an album for them. Then the Meat Puppets, by, by then we were good friends with the Meat Puppets, and the Meat Puppets signed to some big label. I can't remember which one it was. And they wanted John Paul Jones to produce their album, too. And, and so they called me up to see if I could contact John Paul Jones, and, and I did. And uh, I'd been playing the Meat Puppets for John Paul Jones a lot. You know, I thought he really liked him, and I thought he'd jump at the chance, but he turned him down. 
Wow. And so I called, I called, called them up to tell them the bad news that John Paul Jones didn't want to do it. And they were like, well, you know, they like that bad livers album. Would you do it? And so I was like, yeah, hell yeah. So that was my first paid gig. I got paid to do it and it made a radio hit and a gold record. And, and then uh, sublime liked that album. And that's how I got the sublime gig. So which record did you do with him? With sublime? Yeah. The big one. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Man. Oh yeah. That was, that was my lottery ticket. Whoa, <laughs> dude. Cause I thought you did the sublime with Rome. I didn't know that you did the big one, man. That yeah. Most of I think, the, I think I did like 16 of the songs on that album or something, you know, like Santa Ria and, oh, and man. Uh, wow. the wrong way, those, those kind of things. Yeah. They came out to Austin to do that. Wow. And what was that like? Because, you know, here's this long beach band basically just kind of a bar band and they go out to Austin and do this record. Did they have the tunes together or? Were oh you... yeah. Really? They had a way together. Uh, the, they sent me this tape, which I thought was a demo tape. And what it was, was like three songs that were recorded by a uh, producer, David Kahn, like uh, uh, what I, uh, what I got was one of the songs. And I, I heard that and I was like, Oh my God, you guys don't need me. I mean, whatever you're doing here, just stick with that. And, and, they're like, no, David Kahn doesn't want to use live drums. He likes program drums, and we want to be like a live band, and and uh, we think you're the guy for it. So I was like, okay. Man, that's incredible. It, that record, it had live drums, to, it, but they were they loop? The the songs that David Kahn did were, were yeah. loop, but the ones that I did were, it was all live. And, man, that band could play. There were songs that. You know, normally you go in and you, you know, you record everybody together and then you hope you have a drum track and then you start adding the bass and the guitars and then the vocals. But with that band, you know, you just haven't played the song a couple of times and go, that's it, you know, and the vocals might even be done. He'd be singing in there in the room with the drums. and. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I got some old bootlegs of Bradley Acoustic playing like bars. This guy's killing it. No, he, he could sing and he could play. God, what a, I wish he was still around. I know, man. Last gig was in San Fran, you know? That's the fucking old black tar blues, man. I mean, you know, that shit's <sighs> taking, taking some of the best. We know. I remember yeah. where I was when I got that nasty phone call. Oh, I was in Belgium and my, my first wife called me up and told me, and I, I wasn't surprised at all. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's towards the end of that, our session in, in Austin, it was pretty hairy. I mean, it was a circus. It almost blew up every day. It was. Wow. Was he on it then? Was it, was he out like hunting in Austin? That's got to be interesting, right? Trying to find some dope in Austin. Well, they wouldn't do that in Austin. They'd send somebody back to California and then come back. Whoa. And, uh, you know, they, and they at one point, you know, they took off to, to go to Mexico to buy some, val you know, fake Valiums or whatever. And that's when things really went south. Wow. 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 You've been, you've been surrounded by drug, drug craziness all your career, man. You know? Yeah. Tell me about it. I mean, Meat Puppets, that second album I produced for them, you know, their first single, uh, they, they put it to radio and it broke Michael Jackson's record for most ads in the first week. Wow. And then, and then they, the record label found out that uh, the bass player had a, a heroin problem and wasn't going to be able to tour and they pulled the plug and by the next week it was gone. So it's like, no shit. That's weird that the record company cared. Do you usually do you think they'd be like, we got a hit here, man. And just burn the dudes to the ground. You know, well, then, you know, they probably would have gone with it, but you know, he, he wasn't able to tour and oh. to them, that was the deal breaker. Yeah. 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 Cause then they can't go out and work more singles and make big money. What was that sublime? Like you, uh, once you finished the record, and it comes out, are you just blown away how it just catches fire? I mean, that was an era where music, you know, and I and I really credit Lollapalooza to changing the landscape of people's minds. All of a sudden, now it was like uh, the late 50s, early 60s again, where people just listened to everything that was on the radio, you know? Yeah, that's, uh, Lollapalooza did that, and, and the, the signing of Nirvana did that as well. Their success opened up a lot of doors for a lot of cool bands. I was blown away that the record came out. You know, once once Bradley passed, uh, the label decided they weren't even going to put it out. Wow. And I, I think uh, I think Miguel went, went went to a strip club and 
met the program director for K-Rock in L- L.A. or something and said, hey, you got to listen to this band. And they went out to their limo with some strippers and played the stuff we recorded. And, and he was like, oh, man, this has got to be on the radio. And he put it on the radio. And, and then the label changed their mind and decided to release it. And I mean, that was crazy time because that, that record came out uh, not too long after the uh, our Butthole Servers album with Pepper came out. And, right. You know, I, it was freaky watching uh, Pepper go to number one on the radio charts. And I was just like, that was so weird. And then next thing you know, uh, Sublime's first single is going up the charts. And and so it was, it came to number one just as Pepper was starting to, to go down a little bit. And so I was like, man, I felt on top of the world for that. Were you floored that Pepper became a, a huge, it was a monster hit. Were you like, wow, this, I mean, it's so outside the box. It's kind of like, you know, just one fix ministry, this different type of stuff, cake, anything that would, would climb up the charts. You'd be like, wow, everybody's digging this. This is wild. Right. Were you shocked? It was, it was shocking, but you know, by then so many shocking things were happening to us that I was starting to get a little numb to everything. It was just, none of it seemed real. It just, I thought I was in a dream or something and that I was going to wake up and I was going to still be on the floor next to somebody's cat box and all that's, (laughs) <laughs> yeah game changer you know we, we recorded that song you know we, we had a, a whole album ready to record and we worked with uh steve thompson thompson bobby Airy? yeah oh yeah yeah and we did that up in in bearsville new york and uh you know we we spent a week just practicing the songs in the studio before we actually started recording and and one of the last things uh, we did was uh, Steve said, let's, we need a whole new song. Let's just come up with one more song. Paul, why don't you play a riff? And I was like, what key? And he goes, G. So I started playing the riff to Pepper. You know, I'd never played it before. I just, you know, just farted it out. And uh, they started building a, a song from there. And uh, Gibby kind of checked out on it. You know, he, he did vocals. He worked on it vocals and got those good and then kind of checked out on the process. And, and Steve Thompson and I, spent time together in uh, Steely Dan studio in, in Manhattan and brought in uh, Mark Ettinger to play keyboards and, and did the production thing way up. And, and uh, Kitty hated it. He was like, God, I just hate that. And then, and then it starts going up the charts. It's like number 10. I'm like, Hey, Gibby, we're in top 10. You know, do you like it now? And he's like, no. And it was like, well, it's, it's number five this week. Gibby, do you like it? No. And then finally it's number one. And I go number one. Now Gibby, now do you like it? He goes, no, it should have been number one half. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my God, dude. I mean, that song was everywhere. And it also got you guys a lot of action for soundtracks and stuff. I mean, you guys did that underdog uh, remake. You know, here I come to save the day. I love it, man. All of a sudden, Butthole Surfers is like mainstream. It's so wild. It seems like it's somebody made that story up because I, you know, I can't imagine that that was my life. Yeah. Yeah. What's your relationship with uh, Gibby these days? What's it like? Uh, well, we're brothers till the end. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're still a tight band. We're, <clears throat> we, we communicate, you know, I, I haven't talked to him maybe a month, but it's getting about time to talk to him again. Yeah. Where's he at? Is he in Texas? No, he's in uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Yeah, wow. he's been he's been in New York and Brooklyn now for gosh, at least fifteen years, I think. He's 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 married to a he's married to a successful attorney. He's what? Got a, he's got a like a ten year old son that's a, a baseball phenom, and uh, he's he's living the the good life. Holy shit, man! He made it. You know, I mean, a lot of those guys didn't make it out. That were a lot of know. those guys didn't make it out. I know. There's some serious uh, rubble from the road. You know, that is wild. You guys think that uh, you'll play again or no? No, it's over. It's over. I I never want to play live ever again. I mean, it's it's a whole lot of fun. Being on stage for an hour is is about the most fun that you can have in life but those other 23 hours in the day just suck yeah you know i've seen every denny's in america i've been you know we've been to europe more times than i can count we've done japan a couple of times and australia a couple of times and you know i just got tired of traveling and i've got a nice house and a beautiful wife so i don't even i don't even like to leave the house anymore (laughs) 
I know people are out there shooting each other. There's fucking diseases and everything. You you do start, especially I'm at 55 and I'm starting to feel that I'm a comedian, you know, and I do love that because I don't have to have band members or do we don't play my song or whatever. It is pretty easy, but this COVID is the first time I've been home in 35 years for a year. So it's kind of like, well, this what are you going to do? What are you going to do when it's over? Are you going to go back out or are you, are you starting to, to like the home life? Well, I love stand up more than anything I've ever done. I was I actually for the first time traveled a couple of weeks ago, I went out to Des Moines, Iowa, land of no mass, you know, the red hats. And, uh, yeah, it, was, it, it, it is. A, if it's, everything's different now, though, you know, the, the with the politics and the um, and and everything, you know, the Karens and and the, the crazies with the guns and everything. It's just kind of like and I'm not speaking in a, some kind of liberal way. I'm just saying, like, as you get older, you're like, fuck, man, people are crazy, you know? People yep. are crazy. I've lost quite a bit of respect for the human race in the last few years. <laughs> I'm beginning to think putting flora in the water was a bad idea. Yeah, that's something. Either that or it was that uh, Accutane or whatever they're taking for acne. Something rocked us. You know? uh, yeah, uh, aspartame. and Yeah, yeah well, aspartame's a fucking demon, man. Diet Coke. I, I often say that uh, I blame it on these hippie moms, you know, like we used to moms used to smoke and drink when they're pregnant and it kind of toughened the people up. Now they're just pop popping out softies, <laughs> you know, I mean, a bunch of Bradens, you know, I'm Braden. It's like, uh oh, you're going to be fucking you're going to be a school shooter <laughs> you know, something. I don't know. I wanted to get into a little bit of the artwork of your album covers. I always love the artwork. Uh, I'm a giant. I love art. I love it. And uh, the artwork of your covers and the names of the records were so fantastic. Who did the artwork? You guys? Um, for the most part, I think by the time uh, I can't even remember the name of the album that had Pepper on it. Was it Ele oh, Electric uh, Larry Land? Or? Yeah, Electric Larry Land. Yeah, that, I think uh, I think we hired a you know, we licensed artwork from somebody for that. But before that, Gibby and I would were mostly the the art creators. You know, it was, it was almost like being in a band was an excuse to to make album covers. Oh, that's so good, man! I love them because I'm I'm so into stuff that's like really original and and great, and it's it's really hard to do. You were talking about album titles. You know, my favorite album title. What we did was. Uh, an album called like P.O.'d or something. I oh, don't even yeah. know how to Pissed pronounce off. it. And yeah. We we got that album titled by throwing a dirty sock at a keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Just whatever it typed out, you mean? Yeah. Wow. I love the one record that didn't have the song titles. Just <laughs> that was oh good. yeah. Was that was that locust abortion technique? Yeah, yeah. Or? Yeah, yeah. That's a great record, man. Yeah, probably in retrospect, it probably wasn't a good idea to to give the songs titles because it kind of makes it hard to collect money on them. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, it's like uh, and that song was a uh, horse with erection taking a dump. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because they were drawings, you're right. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I did those. I did those little drawings. You know, I'm I'm proud of those. And um, a couple of years ago on eBay, somebody was selling sneakers that had those drawings on Converse canvas high tops. Oh so man! I, I I bought a pair in my size, and then I keep them in a china cabinet. <laughs> That's hilarious! Like someone was hand drawing them. I don't know how they got it. They they were printed somehow. Somehow they got you know copied the images and got yeah. them onto canvas. And then the other thing I I've been, was buying on eBay for a while was uh, somebody was turning our album covers into shower curtains. No shit. Full sized. And uh, so that those made great Chris, Christmas presents one year. Although I don't think anybody I've ever given those to has ever used one. Oh, that's amazing, man. Just a shower curtain. You know, that that Locust record, that's kind of the blueprint of like dirgy grunge, you know? That that record is really like wow. This is this is kind of the the roots here of that stuff, you know. Other than Sabbath, right? We we were living out in uh, Winterville outside of Athens, and uh, we we wanted to record a record, so we we came up with this one inch eight track machine that stood about eight feet tall and weighed about five thousand pounds. 
and uh, you could just plug a microphone straight into the back of it. And so we bought a microphone and we had that big tape machine and we, you know, filled up our eight tracks. And then uh, we went to New York and we had enough money to, to hire somebody to mix one song. And we, we found this guy named Andy Wallace. Oh my God, Andy Wallace. <laughs> Andy fucking Wallace. And, uh, Shit. you know, so we're in, we're in Manhattan and we go to this uh, studio complex and the, the mix room we worked with them in was the size of my island in my kitchen. You know, it was tiny. The three of us crammed in there and, and he, you know, he pulled out his uh, Lexicon PCM 42s to load kick and snare samples onto. And he, he traded our drums out a little bit. And we were like, God, what's this guy doing? And next thing you know, it's, it's sounding incredible, you know? And, and then the, we asked him if it was okay, if we spoke to joint in the studio. And so we fired up a joint in this little tiny room and, he must have gotten a contact high because next thing you know, he's like reaching for the reverbs and stuff. <laughs> he was a swell guy. He, he he came to our shows after that a few times. Well, I mean, he I, became I regretted a, that we never worked with him again. Yeah, I mean, he fucking crushed it on Nirvana. Holy shit. Yeah, and a few other things. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of other things. Do you look back on uh that rough trade lawsuit era. How do you look at that now these days? Was it, I mean, it was needed to be done, right? You were getting you mean the off. touch and go lawsuit. Oh yeah. That one. Sorry. Yeah. You know, that was a, a sore spot for a while, but you know, now I kind of laugh about it. You know, we were touch and go was, was a great label for us and we were great for them. You know, we kind of put each other on the map and then, uh, you know, they, they got kind of big and then they, they started signing friends of ours. And uh, then we realized that uh, one of the bands that were friends of ours, they were giving them a better deal than they were giving us. And so we were like, hey, man, you know, we want to renegotiate. We didn't have a contract. It was just verbal. Right. And so we said, we want the same deal they're getting. It's like, no, no, I own your stuff for life. It's like, wow. wait a minute, you can't own us for life. I mean, that's just ridiculous. And so Capital came along and we signed to them and, you know, we, we wanted our stuff back. And I don't even remember who, who sued who. But it ended up in like Circuit Court of Appeals in Chicago, and which is nuts. I mean, that's where serious cases are. Yeah. And uh, you know, we won. We won both of the. Uh, you know, the, we both the trial and the appeal. And I, the the judge in the circuit court said that uh, the lesson to be learned was that a verbal contract is worth less than the paper it's printed on. <laughs> So you're going to win automatically because it's, it's your word against his. And since it's your music, it's, you're going to win. Right. Well, they, you know, there was like some weird copyright law from the seventies and it was intended to protect, protect uh, copyright holders from being exploited. And the, the law says that if you'd license a copyrighted work, it's for a minimum of 50 years or something. And what they meant to say was maximum of 15 years. It was just, some wording that was just stupid and touch and go clung to that. Like, you know, and had they won, it would have been devastating for, you know, musicians and writers and anyone who painters, anybody that licenses their work would have just been screwed because all you had to do is license a work and then you'd own it forever. You know? So, you know, we, we kind of like cl clarified copy, some copyright law. That's great. That's great. I mean, you've had like numerous label bell. I mean, like with Jello, right? Hey, go record a record and I'll pay him when it's done. And then he doesn't pay him. And then they, that guy puts your record. I mean, and then, and then you're with touch and go and, and then capital, you get into some battles. I mean, you were deep into the music business at the same time you're being punk rock out there, which is kind of tough, right? Yeah. You know, I've, alternative tentacles was really good to us. And I, I still love those guys a lot. And, uh, but I just remember one time, you know, I was homeless, and uh, we put out the record about a year after it came out. I called him up to say, hey, you know, when do we start getting paid on that? And it's like, well, we would have sent you money, but we needed that money to finance the next Dead Kidneys album. So I was like, <laughs> that's not that's not what I signed up for. I mean, I yeah. like Dead Kidneys, but I don't want to be the guy bankrolling it for free and. Oh my God, that's insane, right? And I got, he just tells you, like, hey man, we signed you so we can make some money to make a new record. I don't think that's why they signed us, but it just kind of like fell in their lap. Right, right. I know, I know. It's just funny to think, uh, Jello, you know, it's, uh, you got to love that fucking band, you know? Holy smokes. What a, what a, what a monster 
monster of originality right there, man, vocally and, uh, and, and just everything about it. The album could talk about album covers, right? Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about that one Geiger, you know, that they got sued for. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I was listening to a lot about whole service last night and some dead Kennedy's, uh, over the, I listened to dead Kennedy's all the time over the last couple of years. And, uh, and then recently started listening to, um, wall of voodoo again, Stan Ridgeway. And it's funny to hear like, I'm on a Mexican. It's kind of got this vocal stylings of butthole surfers and dead Kennedy's, you know, and kind of a twangy guitar vibe. Hello. We were definitely influenced by both Wall of Voodoo and Dead Kennedys. You know, by the time Mexican radio came out, I was kind of over it. But what, they had that uh, Ring of Fire, I think, was the first Wall of Voodoo right. song. That- right. Yeah. I remember a solo one, Camouflage, Camouflage. <laughs> he went solo and had that song, Camouflage, with a cu- cuckoo video, man. That guy was great. I saw him at the US Festival, man, Wall of Voodoo. What a day. I saw The Clash, Wall of Voodoo, Stray Cats. You know, I think Oingo Boingo is just like, wow. We opened up for Oingo Boingo once. Oh, you did? Uh, you know that, or I was a stagehand when they came through San Antonio, Texas. I can't remember. Yeah. What What was it like growing up in San Antonio? Was it pretty uh, redneck back then, or what, what was it like? Um, there was a lot of rednecks, but there's a lot of Hispanics, too. And so, like, if you were in school, you kind of had to choose your crowd and and I, I chose the Hispanic crowd. I mean, they were a lot more fun and the rednecks were not so much fun. They were just mostly jerks, <laughs> but it, uh, it was, it was a cool place. I, I couldn't wait to leave. You know, that was my goal in life was to get out of San Antonio. So. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Rose. You ever see that Bette Midler, the Rose? It's, oh. it's kind of, it's kind of the uh, Janis Joplin story, but they couldn't get the rights. So they just called it the Rose and ripped her story off. Just a weird reference. I throw at you. For some reason, that made me think about what was the movie? Was it Honeysuckle Rose that had oh, Chris yeah. Christopherson and Willie Nelson? Or? Yeah, that was great. Chris Christopherson crushed it on Star is Born. I love that film. I love it. Made me want to live in Santa Fe and have a fucking one of those bungalows, you know, with a Ferrari driving around the desert 100 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that, that is a, a cool state. It is. It is, man. Santa Fe and Taos. You can't beat that shit, man. I love that uh, driving over that bridge into Taos. You know, it goes over the that whatever canyon that is, Rio Grande Canyon, and you, you stop and look out, and it's like two thousand feet down. This shit is scary, man. It is scary, right? You're like, who built this thing, man? I'm always blown away by that shit. Like, or that you know, that's the stuff you see on the road, man. Like that tunnel at the Vale Pass. That's like a zillion miles long. You're like. Can you imagine each day? Here we are. We put, yeah, we played music and, uh, you know, our lives. And can you imagine each day, 5 a.m.? All right, throw on the stuff. Go, 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 go. Just jackhammering 27 miles through a mountain or 17 or whatever it is. Fuck that. I'll take the record company battles any day. No kidding. Yeah. What are you up to these days, man? I know you're producing and stuff, but are you still playing guitar? I just put out a solo album. Oh wow! Oh cool, man. What is it? Came out. It came out in February. It's called Born Stupid. It's on the Shimmy Disc. That's great. That that label, Shimmy Disc, was a label owned by my good friend Kramer, who actually played bass for us on our first European tour. And we remained friends over the years. And and he had this label, and then he stopped being a label, and then he started up again uh, this last winter. And I'm the first new release on his new label, Shimmy Disc. Wow. Is it similar to your last solo record? No, it's not similar at all. And thank goodness, I, you know, but it was 30 years in between those two records. Damn. 30 years. Yeah. And it, it, it actually, you know, on this first week, you know, the first pressing sold out in like eight hours or something like that. It was really, really fun. And because of that, it made uh, five or six billboard charts in one week. Wow. Including, including best new artist. Best new art. 
Crack me up. Hey man, I'm 63. I'm the best new artist out there. <laughs> it's like a, I do comedy and they got a thing called Fresh Faces up in Montreal. It's a big comedy festival, you know? And I'm always like, when are they going to have old faces? I'll be perfect for that, you know? Because everybody's all young and I'm 55. I've only been doing comedy 10 years. I'm, hey, catch me at old faces. <laughs> That's great. Best new artist at 63 years old. I love it. I'm in another band called Cocky Bitches. Oh wow! And you play around? Do you play it live at all, or no? No, we yeah. we, we did put we did put out an album on Slope Records out of uh, Arizona, and uh, I don't think anybody bought that record. But I'm actually very proud of it. And I think the next thing I do will probably be another Cocky Bitches album. Wow! I gotta listen to that today. And then the solo record it's uh it's on streaming. Yeah, go everything. go over to Spotify and, and check it out. Oh, yeah. I don't use Spotify, but I'll check out iTunes for sure. Yeah, it's, I'm sure it's on iTunes as well. Josh Freeze played drums on that. Oh, God. Old friend of mine, like 35 years. Love him, man. How great is that? Did he just you send him the stems or how did it go down? Um, he, act, he actually flew to, to Austin on his dime. Wow. To play drums on my record. And this is like, wow. That's sick. You know, he's he drummed for Devo for like 20 years and he was oh, a yeah. perfect circle and just oh, I mean yeah. he's a lot he's a lot of fun. That guy is is a hoot. He's a really swell guy. The guy's one of the greatest drummers and he's an incredible human, great dad. Uh it's got a smoking house in Long Beach. I love it, man. Old school craftsman. I've only seen a couple of pictures of the inside. He's he's got like a big poodle and he dyes his poodle different colors. He's so great. You know, he started at Disneyland playing yeah. in that band there, man. His dad was the musical director at Disneyland, and that's so, how he got that gig. What a great story. And not only that, but how fucking good is that guy, dude? You know, he played in Dweezil Zappa, and they did this, I think it's 51 or 45 minute medley of all the great rock songs. And if you've never heard that, Try to find it. Look at it on YouTube. And the way they do it, it's like, you know, if they're going like they're doing one hit and say it has a word in it that'll go into the next one. So it's like and then he came around on his bicycle, bicycle. And then they, I mean, I mean it's just all the way through dropping on these key words like and it's it, it, I've never seen anything like it. And they're playing it live, you know, Keneally, Scott Tunis. Josh Freeze, you know, it's basically kind of the Zappa band with Dweezil and stuff. And it, it was he, one he grew up down the street from Dweezil. I mean, they I, were I know. they were childhood friends and he'd go over to Zappa's house. And hang I know. Out. I know. Oh, man, it's so great. Right. in Laurel Canyon, just spending the weekend up there, you know, at Frank's place. No, yeah, he's, he's got a really incredible memory. Like, you know, he he's perfect for that kind of style of you know changing up and stuff because uh one time i was working with them and i'd recorded a bunch of just jams i'd done at home and i mean they were nonsensical jams that you know were three measures here six measures there i mean it was just you know for 20 minutes and the first take he kind of like struggled through it then the second take he knew where everything was so, you know he, he would just wham it's wow. like wow i don't even know that stuff yet and he's, he's got it all figured out yeah yeah he did one of the most incredible things. I know he did it because we were sitting there watching him on the couch. But at the at that jam, at that at the rehearsal, they were doing this 45 minute thing or whatever. And midway through, he he took his jacket off while he was playing without missing a beat and then lit a cigarette and put it behind his ear. And kept going. <laughs> and we were like, we know he did it for us, but it's something I never fucking forgot. And I was like, I can't even believe this guy. He's a goddamn fucking monster machine. How long, the- how long ago was that? It's like, fuck. Let's see. I'm 55. So I never saw him smoke a cigarette. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is when we were kids, dude. So I'd say 35 years ago. Oh, I think okay. the record was called Shampoo Horns. And uh, yeah, Zappa. But yeah, I mean, we were kids, you know, that's how long. What's your, what's your favorite Zappa album? Well, you know, it's really tough to, to think about because I go through all the eras, but I did, you know, shake your boot, you know, uh, I, I like that. It's just different eras, you know, I mean, I like a lot of the live stuff, really. That's what I like to get into, you know, like just watching and listening to the live stuff because it's just like, what is this even like? These guys are playing this live. 
you know? Yeah, it's it's way out there. Christ I saw him live fuck. in San Antonio back in the 70s, and, well, you know, he was playing that stuff, and, you know, a stuffed carrot would walk across the stage, and then yeah. something else weird, and, and the crowd was just sitting back, just like, blown away and and then about halfway through the show he started getting down on us for not you know rocking harder you know it's like we're all blown yeah. away and <laughs> what do you want I, us to do i love frank's garage you know but chic or booty you know it's kind of like um, that's what it came out when i was at the age where i was kind of like you know well it's zappa you know it's it's so weird to think about and then dug backwards that that zappa uh documentary that alex winter did is mind-boggling if you haven't seen that i mean i have i need to see that alex is a friend of mine we go way back yeah yeah he's a great guy and and man zappa's story just you know starting out there in like barstow or whatever and you know, uh, you know, that city didn't like him. So they arrested him on like porn charges because he was making weird music and stuff. And that sounds like inspiration for one of the songs off of Uncle Meat. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because he did write about all, all of that stuff, you know, Tiny Policeman, all that shit. Uncle Meat, Uncle Meat is, is my favorite album of all time by anyone. I think. Really? Yeah. Wow. I've been tempted to, uh, I think it, my next solo album, I want to, to just re-record all of Uncle Meat in order and just do it. Dude, you should do that. That would be so cool, man. It would be so cool. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I you know, Scott Tunis uh, was a, a longtime friend of mine. He played in my band. So him and this other guy, Ed Berman, really would teach me the ways of Zappa. It, it, it takes a long time to figure out the layers of Zappa. And uh, at the same time, I was getting into P funk and all that. So I was really getting into just way different music for a while, just to break away from classic rock, you know, that you grow up on. And then I got into the full alt country scene or whatever. I like to dive into uh, scenes and and find it all where it comes from and all that shit. You know, that's why I was really interested. What your uh, your ground zero was besides the Beatles. There it is Zappa, because that is the thread. I think of all alternative outside the box music. I truly believe that. Yeah. Can't argue with that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so happy to have you on and uh, it was great to talk to you, man. I got to listen to this soul record. Give everybody the name of the record again. Born stupid, born stupid. And yeah, it's I've, out- I've got, I've got three videos on the, uh- YouTube right now, including Born Stupid, uh, which I made all by myself. First video I ever made, and I did it with my iPhone. And uh, I, all it cost me was like a, a $90 for a cheap green screen background. And and then uh, I've, I've got a, another video being made by Josh Freeze. He's making a video for one of the songs right now. He should be about finished. Oh, wow, man. That is so I'm looking cool. forward to that. Wow. I can't wait to see that. I'm going to watch the videos. And they're on your YouTube channel. You got a YouTube channel, or are they just out there? Uh, it's just on YouTube. If you type yeah. in Paul Leary, it'll it'll come up. I love I love like uh, you or say myself that you have graphs the internet, and and of course you've been recording all your life and everything. But you're constantly learning stuff, so you can just stay relevant and not be like I gotta call some guy. Hey, I gotta have a son so he can show me how to work the internet. You know those people. <laughs> I, I tried to do it, a Zoom interview with a guy last week, and he goes, "Man, I got my son's got COVID. I got to wait till he feels better so he can download that Zoomer, you know, and show me how to work it." It's, <laughs> it's kind of like, dude, you ain't gonna make it, man. You ain't gonna make it. You know, you gotta, you, you, you asked me to wear uh, headphones or earpods when I when I did this, and it dawned on me last night I don't have you know earpods or anything, and and uh, I have headphones, but my uh, iPad and phone don't have a jack for it. And my wife has an old iPad. So she loaned me her iPad and, and these plugs here so I can talk to you today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the reason I just want to tell you real quick and, and other people why uh, when you're using zoom, you'll get digital feedback and warble from my voice coming out of your speakers as you're talking. And I try to tell people this. I was interviewing a woman a couple of weeks ago in England. I won't even drop her name, but and she's like, it sounds fine. I go, yeah, but you don't understand. It's it's not going to record fine because you get this, you know, mm. if we both talk at the same time, 
it's hearing your speakers and your voice. So it gets lost and then it becomes just horrible. But like this, it's fantastic, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, it makes sense. I'm, I'm going to do it like this going forward. Yeah. Well, thank you for all your amazing music and uh and what a what a solid human you are just uh, thanks for doing the show it was fantastic to oh, talk thanks for to talking you. to me i'm really flattered oh yeah come on man you heard and damn. i hope you'll i hope you'll come through austin you know on your on your next stand-up tour oh yeah oh you know what i'll be there pretty soon because texas is open uh texas was the last headlining show i did Right before the lockdown, I landed. You're going to love this one. I land on a Saturday. Show sold out. I was down on State Street or whatever, the main street there. And uh, outdoor rock venue, 250 people. I go, this is going to be great. I'm walking through the airport. The guy drops the newspapers the, the day, uh, that day, Saturday newspaper. And I see it uh, South by Southwest canceled. And and immediately I go, oh, no, oh, fucking no. Uh, an assassination has just happened in this city and it is going to be gloomy today. And let me tell you, it was. And a lot of people, when that happened in Austin, were like, well, maybe this is a little serious. And the tickets were forty dollars. There was about 30 people that didn't come. And I don't blame them or anything, but that's when I was like, oh, shit's about to change. I headlined mm -hmm. that show, flew home in the morning, and then it was just kind of over. Wild. So I will be back out, and I will hit you up, and we will uh, hang out and uh, eat some barbecue. I don't know if you eat meat. and uh, I do. My wife doesn't. but uh, Yeah. We'll eat some meat and uh, laugh together. You, who do you like comedy? You watch comedy? <sighs> you know, I'm sure I could tell you if I thought about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's funny because a lot of your stuff is funny. The album covers, the album titles. The, there was a show. There was a show out for a while called Tim and Eric. Yeah. Do you remember that one? No. It's oh, really... Tim and Eric. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you said turmeric. <laughs> my, <laughs> my right, my right ear is fried. I'm like turmeric. I take that. <laughs> you know? take oh, look at that. That's Paul Stanley. <laughs> I didn't know you had Paul Stanley at the house. Look at that cat. It's beautiful. Perfect. Be a rescue, rescue kitten. Perfect. Uh, perfect. You want to see Gertie? Yeah. That's what I was going to ask earlier. Okay. Gertie. Come here, Gertie. Give me a Gertie. Oh, Hi. dear Lord. Hi, Gertie. Oh, Give me kisses. God. Gertie. <laughs> Oh, good. Impossible to be to be depressed around that face. You can't. It just, it, you know, people are like, yeah, Prozac. I'm all, this is Prozac right here. Without without the bad effects. Yeah, without the bullshit. Oh, what a sweetheart. I'll tell you a funny story. I haven't told anybody this story, but a few days ago, I was in the coffee shop, just in line, waiting to get a coffee. And I looked down and she was just looking at me like fired up, like, yeah, like that. And I started to cry and I looked like a psycho. I was so happy that I started to cry. I was like, oh, oh, I love you. And it was it was nuts. I just had to step outside. You know, it was fucking, that's that's what she the effect she has on me. You know, that face is priceless. I know. And she said the personality is incredible. You know, she does so many weird things that make me laugh. It's hilarious. Well, congrats on that. I mean, good yeah. job. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing the show. And I will hit you up when I come to town. And I'm going to listen to the solo record today. I can't wait to hear that and look at the videos. And I will post up the videos in my feed and uh, have people check that out. Well, I, I appreciate that. And uh, send, me, send me a link and I'll put, post it to my socials. You got it. I'll get it out to you. Uh, it'll be out in a few weeks. Right on. Thank you so much, Paul. I look forward to talking to you again. Oh, I can't wait, man. See you later. Later on. Later.